First up, a couple announcements. Uh, first thing, some of you in here have come to talk to me and I've talked about the um, cybersecurity concentration and the scholarship for service program we have specifically for cybersecurity students. Uh, we're having an information session on Friday, this coming Friday, I believe, is that right? Yes. Um, I will post more information on the Piazza Friday, 3 p.m. and 4.30 p.m., UAC 270. We're going to go over the cybersecurity program, how the job market for cybersecurity is insanely um, hot. They're, I think they said they have like a negative uh, unemployment rate, so basically they can't fill all the positions that they have. Um, we'll talk about our cyber uh, sponsor for service program, and we'll be available to hang out and talk. So, if you want more information about scholarship, about cybersecurity concentration, please attend. Any questions on that? Is that one where you go over to the FBI profile afterwards? You can, yeah. So it's uh, basically it pays, the scholarship pays for a year's worth of tuition plus a monthly stipend plus book support. And in exchange for every year of support, you pledge to work for the federal government for a year. So it doesn't have to be the FBI, it can be FBI, NSA, CIA, actually any government agency, federal agency will do. So a lot of people go to a lot of different places. So yeah, we, we are looking to support people. We have funding from the National Science Foundation to do that. So if that's interesting to you, if you're liking some stuff in this course, please attend, we can talk more there. Any other questions? I made this announcement uh, on Piazza. I'll make it again here. Uh, unfortunately, no office hours for you today, but surprise, you don't have a homework assignment, so I assume none of you were going to show up anyways, but in case you were, uh, if you want to meet or you need to meet, uh, email me. We can find a new time, a better time, just for today. Uh, let's see, there's something else. Oh, what do you think about this second assignment? Are you all expert C++ code readers? Did anybody learn it? Yeah. I just wanted to say that was the most fun I've had with homework assignment ever. Cool. Yeah. Which part, the bandit or the breaking stuff? Both of them. Both of them. Okay, cool. Noted. And you're not just saying that to try to get easier homework assignments? <laughs> Did you learn anything new from reading this other C++ code? Anybody? I definitely learned new stuff, like the string stream. I had no idea you could like use that to parse a string and then use the uh, arrow operators to extract things. Um, that was actually pretty cool. That made uh, it made uh, the C++ parsing really nice. Yeah. Like the files submitted that we had to break, were they from like this class? Some of them. Some, yeah. I took a sampling of many things. Some from us. Was anybody shocked to, uh, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> shocked to find your own sample in there? <laughs> All these dirty bugs added to it? Yeah. So we tell many of you for homework assignments are going to use band or are we going to have that person? And what's my word of saying that? I'm not certain yet. I would say you're half, I mean, you already have them all, so I'd save them. Um, we may do some more. I think it's a super helpful exercise, and they get a little bit more complicated and advanced. Um, Cool. All right, let's rock and roll back to crypto. Break some stuff. All right. So here we are. We're given this cipher text. How do we break it? What are the steps we're going to take to try to break this? Yeah. Ladder? Look for repeated characters, why? Yeah, do we know what kind of encryption it is yet? Technically, no, we're just given this, right? Of course, you know, and you all know here that we're doing this in the context of uh, Vinare ciphers, so it's highly likely it's encrypted with that, right? But how can we check and try to see, is it a Caesar cipher, which we've seen, or is it a Vino, man, I lost the name. I always have to refresh my mind. I'm going to ignore it for now. Or this other cipher. Visionaire, there we go. I need it. 
French pronunciation in my head. What was it? Statistical, statistical analysis of what? Uh, letter distribution. Letter distribution. So we'd calculate the frequency of the letters in the ciphertext and then do what with that? So uh, Caesar cipher should still maintain the shape of normal English? Yeah, so the Caesar cipher should maintain that shape of English with the correct peaks and valleys, whereas what about in this case? Yeah, it should be closer to equal distribution, right? So depending on the key size, all those kinds of things. Cool, so we can do that. We can say, okay, we think it's not a Caesar cipher. Uh, maybe it's a visionaire cipher. So then we can look for rep repetitions in the ciphertext. And specifically, why are we looking for repetitions in the ciphertext? Go here. Yeah, indicating repeated words in the, not just the ciphertext, but where the keys aligned exactly the same over those repeated words, right? And we're looking for that, and because that's going to tell us hopefully what, or give us information about what? The period. The period, right? The size of the key, right? So we're trying to figure out the size of the key so that we can break this thing. So we went over this, we went over a lot of the repetitions in the ciphertext. We all spotted the largest one, uh, O-E-Q-O-O-G. And we looked through all of these and we tried to think about uh, different periods. And of course, in different key lengths, we may be wrong, right? So we're just going to start with uh, the first one that we can kind of think of. We'll start with six and then we'll work through that, see, and we'll have ways to kind of check our guess to see if it works. So we may have to do some kind of backtracking here as we do this, right? It's not necessarily a deterministic process of. You do X, Y, Z, then you've broken the crypto system. <coughs> cool. So we can use a, another statistical measure, talking about statistics, right? We can use this notion of an index of coincidence. So in a sense, this is the notion of <coughs> if you randomly grab one letter from the ciphertext, What's the probability that the next letter you grab from the ciphertext is the same letter? So what is that telling us about the ciphertext, or about any text? Because we can apply that to any text. Yeah, do you have your hand up? Do you want to have your hand up? Yeah. I don't know how it would be used, but I mean, what it literally means is the difference between <laughs> Uh, like two characters within the key, like that difference, and then the difference of like that first key, that first character, and the second character in the original string, and then those differences added together. Well, okay, let's key. think about it. Well, yeah, let's think about just what what does this just actually mean, right? I mean, does, we can take it away from ciphertext, right? We can say. So if I had some ciphertext that was, let's say. So my cipher text is just all A's, I'll just repeat until forever. Right? Infinite. So I draw an A, what's the probability that my next one's going to be an A? 1. It's 100%, right? There's no other prob probabilities. Uh, now, what if this was completely random? So A, and okay, this is not completely random, so I'm drawing it in order. What if it just repeated like this through Z over and over an infinite number of times? So I grab an A, what's the odds that I'll grab an A next? 0 over 26. 1 over 26, not 0, right? Because there's, assuming it repeats forever, right? I grab an A, that means there's an infinite number of A's, but the distribution of each of the characters, right, is 1 over 26. They're equal likelihood that the next character I'm going to grab So I'd see that, you know, and this is the, and this is about just the letter. So if we're thinking about the index of coincidence for just the letter A, and the first one it's highly skewed, and the second one, then I can calculate that for every character, and for, the, actually I guess this is a very poor example, because I think they have the same index of coincidence. It would be one for A and zero for all the other ones. Here it would be one over 26, one over 26 for, let's say, A, B, C, and so on. But in some sense, this gives you some notion of kind of how random 
is the text. It's squishing it all into one value, yeah. Is it 1 over 26? Or like, if you had like a whole bunch of A's, like 50 A's and 1 B's, it's still like 1 over 2? So that's a good example. Okay, so let's do that. We can probably get back at that pretty quickly. Uh, let's not do 50 because I think I'll have to draw that one. Let's say, uh, what's that? 4 A's and 1 B. So what's the index of coincidence of A? So you grab an A. 4 fifths. 4 fifths. And what about B? 1 fifth. And C? Zero, right? So on. So yeah, so this, and then here when we're, we're calculating these numbers, this is summing all of this up. So we would assume for completely random text. Yeah, please. So this is the probability that given you selected some character, that you select the same character again, right? Exactly. So would it be three fourths per A? Or like, are we allowed to select the same character twice? Mm. That's a good question. I think with sufficiently large text, it doesn't matter is what we'll go with for now. Um, but yeah, so we may need to tweak our uh, probabilities there because we only have five characters. But for the purposes here, we're looking at really so large text, and we can calculate this, and this could actually try to give us some high-level notion of what the period guess is. So this could actually help us to say, are we completely off? So if we ran this, and it's large at 0 0.038, you'd say, wow, that's really close to 1 over 26. So maybe this text is more random than we think. Um, why is, let's say, 1 0 0.066? Yeah. The shortest string is always long, but like, it's more likely that it will run into the same uh, like original text being encrypted by the same <coughs> Right, so the period one, how uh, large is the key size? One, right, which means what's the distribution of characters like? So it would be the same as the Caesar cipher. Yeah, so it's the same as the Caesar cipher, which means the character frequencies look something like this, right? So if you randomly pick from this distribution a character like A, the likelihood that you get A is skewed by the frequency of the letter distributions in English. Right? And so you can calculate, and we'll look at how to calculate the index of coincidence, but the idea being that you can calculate this on a, let's say, all of English or on this type of frequency, and then you can calculate the same thing here. So you can actually use this as another way to verify or try to check. These are, again, we're looking at different statistical measures as we do this. We use a way to check, well, if we calculate the index of coincidence and it's something like 0.066 or roughly around there, and say, hey, maybe it's a Caesar cipher, right? We have other ways to check. We can also look at the distribution, which is uh, much more information than we're just looking at the single value. Yeah. So on the previous slide, we had those like A had four or five, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever. Are each of those indices of coincidence, or what is the index of coincidence in that situation? Yeah. So okay, well, it's, it's probably helpful to look at computing. Uh, so what we're gonna do is uh, I don't really like the negative one makes this a little weird, but. So we are going to, I see, sum of all of the characters i, we'll just call it i. So the frequency of i. The frequency of i times the, all right, I'm going to move this down, sorry. So for every letter i, we're going to calculate the frequency of i in whatever text we're dealing with. Ah, sorry. Frequency of i times the frequency of i minus 1. All of that divided by the number of characters in our text times the number of characters in minus 1. So we're calculating this for every, um, so this is the measure of exactly that probability that we just calculated, right? Of ch choose one, what's the probability that you choose something or the other? Well, it depends on the frequency of that letter uh, times the frequency of that letter minus one over the number, total number of letters times the total number of letters minus one. And we 
sum that up for all the characters, essentially boiling this entire distribution down to one number. So there's a different way of looking at it, right? So rather than looking at this distribution, because if you think, so this is why this is a bad, these two examples are very bad. So what's the index of coincidence of the completely random text? We know it should be like one over 26, or right? And this, if we sum all this up, you'll have 1 over 0, 0, 0. All those zeros cancel out, so it's going to be the same thing. It'll still be 1 over 26. Just because I messed up the way these distributions are. So we can calculate this, and this gives us some notion so that we can use this to double check our estimate. So we can use this to say, let's calculate this on our ciphertext. And we can do this, right? It's just counting. Right? So for each letter, yeah. Um, I'm not really seeing what the value of this would be, but if there was only unique um, like characters, would that be zero or would that be one? Or something else? If there are only unique characters? Yeah, nothing repeated. Would that be possible? That's interesting, yes. I think it would be zero in that case. But again, that is kind of a pathological case that's probably very unlikely to happen in stuff that you're, you care about. Because there'll be enough letters that, assuming more than 26 letters, you'll have stuff that repeats, right? Cool. Yeah, and you have zero coincidence, right? There's no coincidence, there's no repeating letters. Cool. So we can calculate this on our ciphertext, and we get something. Uh, around 0 0.043, which when we look at the periods here, where does 0 0.043 kind of fit? Yeah, with kind of like, and again, of course, these numbers, why are these numbers so close? Yeah? Yeah, so I was confused as to how you can apply this formula so you could use pre-calculated values. You could calculate this actually for these different keys. You could randomize that, right? So actually, you could probably brute force up to five, I would say. Um, there's probably better ways to do it that involve statistics, right? So you could say, um, so you can calculate this for every possible key. It's going to shift all of the alphabets in different ways, and you could calculate that for every key. Does that make sense? So like, let's say we were doing it for period one, right? Sure. Would we be iterating over, like what would the summation go for that case? Sure, so for period one, Right, it's only going to shift the frequency, so A's frequency is now going to be at B because a key of size 1 is only going to move the frequencies. It's not actually going to change the values of the frequencies. So you could use a value that you computed for English text, and you could use a sufficiently large value to calculate that. Alright, so then that can go about for like 2. So then for 2, you know, I, to be perfectly honest, I'd say you use statistics to do that because you base it off probabilities instead of, like, the probability distributions instead of calculating it based on the number n here. Um, but I don't know that that's 100% correct. And so you sum up over the probability, like, as opposed to using the n, like you're saying. Right. You sum up over the probability of seeing the letter b in English text. Yes, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. And then you could 
I'm sure you could figure out how if A was shifted to B and you had every other letter in English, like the probability distribution is going to each, yeah, I mean, if I was doing this, I'd do it on a sufficiently large text. And I'd start with that, and that's what I'd use to calculate that. Yeah. So is this average over like every key? Okay. Yes, this would be every possible key size, exactly. So this formula average over every possible key of that specific subperiod? Yeah. And that's how you get these values. I'm sure there's a better way to calculate this. So in that case, it would be like, the summation would be like s of i times f of i minus 1 times f of i minus 2. Uh, no, 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 because that is the cal that's calculating the probability of pick one, then what's the probability that the next one's the same? And that depends on the frequency of those. And so does the, uh, the, the number just go down when you have larger periods? Because it's getting closer and closer to random, okay. right? Because assuming if you had, uh, let's say, an infinitely large key size, and you assume those are all random, then essentially each letter in your text is being randomly selected to every other letter. And so your distribution would be completely flat in that case. Yeah? Can we just memorize these pre-calculated values? It's more important to know how to use them and be able to calculate them on text that you need. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the derivation is not as important. I think understanding the intuition of what is this trying to capture from the frequency and understanding how does the frequency change as you apply different size keys from that standard English frequency uh, chart? Like from this, right? So understanding how when we have a Caesar cipher, right, this thing just shifts. And that's why it's very easy to break because the essentially the one gram character frequencies of English are still there. And then as we have more and more longer size visionaire keys, how these will approach basically a complete uniform distribution. Yeah. So this index of coincidence is not calculated by um, case by case. This is something that's standard for all. These values that I'm presenting here are calculated across all So these values here are all pre-calculated. So these are given to you, right? But you can then use this formula to cal calculate this on text of your choosing, right? Your ciphertext to compare this to these values to see roughly where does this fit and how does that match your guess, right? Because if you guess six, but the index of coincidence was, let's say, significantly larger, then you'd say something's really wrong here. It's significantly lower. It's just a good way to help Check yourself, yeah. Do you say significantly larger? Do you just mean that it's 0 0.03 more for greater? Yeah, I would say, so for here, right? So over here, it's 0 0.043. So you just use this as kind of a double check. Of, OK, I guess the period was 6. It's 0 0.043, which is right about at uh, 5, maybe slightly greater than 5. So yeah, that actually matches with what I'm thinking about. So if it was like 0 0.4, or like 0 0.04, would that be considered too, like too off? I don't know. I would still try it, probably. But you can keep it in the back of your head, right? If it was uh, 0 0.65, you'd say, hmm, something's weird. Like, why, why am I thinking? I'd say either direction, right? It's probably not going to be lower than 0 0.038, because there's some noise in here, right? Because you only have a finite amount of there's going to be some noise, but this is just a nice way to double check to say, am I on the right track? Without doing the whole, uh, yeah. So one last question. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a, so if a relatively large key is used, are you out of luck as it's approaching that 0.038? Yeah, good point. So what if the size of the key is the size of a ciphertext?
then there's no repetition. There may be repetitions, but the key won't ever repeat over itself. So you won't have any repetitions. The key size is incredibly, so if it's the exact size, right, this should be roughly the same here as 1 over 26. And then how many different alphabets will you have to solve for? What was it? I would say N to the N, right? Or you okay. need, sorry, not, not alphabets, but uh, sorry, that's how many keys you'd have to try, but alphabets would be N, the size of how many, the size of your ciphertext, which means as you're brute, brute forcing that, you could get it to say whatever you wanted, right? Because you could try keys, it would match every possible word or phrase that is that long or sentence. So we'll actually see that. This is called a, um, it's good that you notice that coming up. Uh, we'll talk about that later. It's called a one-time pad, where if you do that and the key is actually randomly generated and it's not a word that we can brute force, which we talked about, if it's as large as the ciphertext and uh, is sufficiently random and it's never reused, then it's actually, quote, quote, perfectly secure. Well, what's the problem with that? Yeah. You have to communicate that key every single time. Yeah, you'd have to communicate a new key every single time that's how big? Same size as the message that you're actually trying to send them. Yeah. Or larger, yeah. So you could send them a message that's larger, but you have to be certain you never reuse the key, right? So this is the main problem. It's like, well, at that point, why not give them the message? If you're already doing this. But there are circumstances where they actually use this. So the, um, I think it's the, uh, there's various uh, times I think with like either nuclear codes or whatever that they exchange like a fat book like this that's just like a random uh, keys and they use that to communicate to each other. And it's perfectly secure, it's a one-time pad, they use it and then I think they rip out that page so they never accidentally reuse it again. Uh, but yeah, that's, that is one way that you can do that. But think about um, if you wanted to, let's say securely transfer a file to your friend, that's a one gigabyte file, you would need a one gigabyte length key that you would exchange in advance. And then later you could securely send them that one gigabyte file. Cool. That was interesting. All right. Okay. So we're just using this to test a little bit. So we can test this. Now that we've guessed that the period is six, what do we want to do with the ciphertext? Split it into different alphabets, right? So split every character into different alphabets, one through six. And then let's try to do that. So we can do this. And another nice thing we can do is we can, again, use the index of coincidence and calculate this on just one alphabet or each of the alphabets. So if we're right in our guess, what would we expect the index of coincidence to be? Right, point, point 0.066, we expect it to be around here because we've now split up the ciphertext into different alphabets that are each encrypted with one key, which matches here. So that's another reason why this is useful as kind of a self-check. So we can split this into alphabets. We can calculate that this is everything that's encrypted with the first letter of the key or what we think is the first letter of the key. The second letter, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So what do we think about this? It's a lot of variation. It's a lot of variation, why? Everything from 0.04 to 0.124. Yeah, so we have really high values of 0.124, but the highest before was 0.066 or something. And we have low values of 0 0.043. So why do we see such high variation here? Yeah. Would that mean that um, our period length is wrong? It could mean our period length is wrong. What else could it mean? Yeah. Um, could be the fact that like that one period that we derived is from like normal English, but the alphabet we have is not really normal English, it's just like a bunch of different characters. Yeah, it could be weirdness that came in with every fifth character, that's possible. What else? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the samples just got cut in six, right? So now instead of our massive text that we have, which has a decent distribution, right? I can't remember how many letters did we say was in this thing? Is it 30 or 40 or 50? Actually, a decent amount of letters to draw a sample from. Here, each of these alphabets has a sixth of that, right? So we'd expect a little bit of variation and yeah, repeated letters that appear in there by coincidence, by chance, will affect our values. Uh, so again, this is where it's a little bit of art, a little bit of guesswork. We have to be okay with going backwards. If they were all around 0.043, or four out of six of them were like that, we'd say, hey, that's probably a massive problem, right? This doesn't make sense. Um, but a lot of them, like the first three are right around 0 0.066, right? Which is one. Uh, we have this one that's close-ish, and this one that's much higher, which is weird, but okay, we can deal with that. And the last one is kind of a weird one, but we can say, hey, out of six, we have five that are pretty close. That's not bad. Like if they were way off, then that we know something was really weird, which we would expect if we were drawing these, if we did five instead and calculated those, we would hopefully would see that they were very uh, different. Does that make sense? Cool. So now we can break each alphabet, right? We can start by trying to break each of these alphabets. What's the key difference that we talked about from breaking each of these alphabets as opposed to a Caesar cipher? Yeah. Yeah, so even if we break, so A, the easy thing is we could just calculate the 26 possible values of a Caesar cipher, try all of them, brute force all the keys until something makes sense. If we just did that for alphabet one, would we be able to figure out and say this makes sense? No, it doesn't make, it's actually very difficult because it making sense, quote, quote, relies on all of the other characters. Right? So, We can um, use all these kind of techniques, and we're going to try, you know, again, this is kind of the puzzle solving aspect, right? We're going to use multiple techniques at our disposal. The other thing that we'll do is, and I kind of like this approach, so, you know, one thing we could do, or, I mean, one thing we could do, right, is we could calculate this for every one of the alphabets and see which shift makes sense. It's a little bit difficult to do, and why is that? Small sample. Yeah, the small sample again, right? Because here we have, I should probably count, can somebody just count? There's extreme peaks? Yeah, so this is um, with, if you play the, what's that game show? The Wheel of Fortune, right? You know, like the popular letters? Uh, what is it like? Yeah, there you go, see? So what we can do is rather than think about it, we can actually kind of, in some sense, compress this down. So we have high peaks, what do we also have? some that appear with very low frequency, and some that we can say appear with medium frequency, just kind of in between, right? So we can compress this somewhat and say, okay, we have some high, some medium, and some low. And what other information is contained in this graph that maybe we can use? So we talked about the vertical, right? We can say some of them have high frequency, some have low. What else is in here? Yeah, so they're about the same level. We can call those a medium, though. We 
difference between adjacent letters? Like E and F, the E's got a dramatic, um, dramatic more frequent than F. And not just, so you have E and F, right? But what about E and G? Or what about E and A, well, specifically what about E and J? Right, so how many letters difference is this? Well, one, two, three, four, five, right? So there's actually also the distance between highs and lows, right? That, that there should, if we look at the probability distribution, there should be about a five letter difference between a high of E and a low of J. And actually going backwards, there's also gonna be a one, two, three, four, five letter difference between E and Z. Right, so we can think in both directions, right? Of highs, mediums, lows, and also distance in some sense from each letter to the other, because remember our distribution should follow that. So there should be in each of these alphabets those same distance between those letters. So there's just another way of looking at this, and we can then try to, there we go. So then we can try to solve each alphabet by here, so what have I done here? So this alphabet one, I have A through Z. What am I doing there with those numbers? Yeah, just counting, right? The frequency of each letter, and this is not even, I'm not dividing it by anything, it's just the raw number of each of those, right? And I can do this for every alphabet that I have, I have six of them, right? And then I can create a nice mapping, actually, from that graph of the letter frequencies that I see in that graph, right? I can say, well, high, medium, 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 high, medium, medium, high, high, medium, 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 high, high, medium, low, high, 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 medium, and then low, 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 kind of all at the end. So now, how does this help me? what shift matches the alphabet here, right? And I can kind of try that to help give me some guesses. So what, is the, what about the first alphabet? So is there anything that says our key can't be A? And in a six character key, is it bad? So we talk about in Caesar ciphers, right? We probably don't want to ever use the key A, because why? That's exactly the same, right? There's no actual shifting being done. But here with a six letter key, is there any reason why one of the letters can't be A? We surely wouldn't want our key to be A, 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 A. Six A's, right? But does that mean that one of them can't be A? So maybe this isn't shifted at all. The first alphabet. A would still shift if I want. You still what? A would still shift if I want. A is zero. So the shift. So A is the zero character, we're just mapping it that way. Oh. Let's say, I mean, the cube, zero, zero shift. No shift whatsoever. Right, so like A mass to A, B mass to A, 
has to be. So if it was B, A would map to B and it would all shift one over to the right. So that's actually why when we talked about Caesar cipher, we had that the key could be 0 to 25, right? For a similar reason. Just like here, when we look at the uh, Visionaire cipher, it could be 0 to 25 for as many characters as they as need. Cool. So this I think is kind of nice. So we can just say, well, maybe we've got the first alphabet. Okay, what else would we look at? Number two, the highs of K, U, and W. Number two, the highs are where? K, U, and W. Sorry, right, number two of K, U, and W. Yeah, the four zero four in that one is the highlighted. Try here. Um, so here we'd say the key was probably A or perhaps A to A. Here we could try this eight. So this would be A to uh, I. What about the third one? Trying to block of zeros to the end, a kind of similar trick. And yeah, so we can shift oh, all my writing. That's probably for the best. So we can try whatever. And it may not always be clean, right? Why? Yeah, maybe like here there are uh, six zeros, so we need to figure out. <coughs> but there's still two and two on either side. So, anyways, so we can do this, right? We can see how we can leverage maybe trying here, moving this five back two so it matches there, and then here this will move that five to M, from O to M. 
which is a medium, or we would try other ways of shifting that to see how that affects everything. So this gives us some stuff to try, right? And maybe we're wrong, and we can start putting it together and trying to piece that piece by piece. Um, so whatever order you're doing this, you could do this kind of in, so we can see, let's see, what are some guesses that we uh, made in the past? So I to A in the third alphabet. So I shifts back to A. And I believe that will shift all these zeros back where we expect them. So the, I think this was actually what we had just said, uh, which is cool. For three, uh, we could try V going to A for the sixth alphabet, sixth uh, V here. And that actually matches up all those zeros. So we actually got, you can see a lot of mileage out of dealing with the, the string of low, uh, low, low values and shifting them to the end, right? So that was actually pretty useful for us. Yeah, this is that same third one that we said. So if we shifted I to A, that would shift all of these zeros all the way to the end, which was uh, the guesses that we could track here. So now we can substitute into the ciphertext. So we can do these shifts on, let's say we've just broken, or we've guessed these three alphabets, the first, the third, and then the sixth. And can everyone see the bold here? Kind of. I mean, every first, third, and sixth character is bold. So you can think about that in your mind. Which um, is not actually the right Oh, yeah, it's okay. okay cool. First, third, sixth. Cool. First, third, sixth. Okay. So now, and we can kind of keep doing that. We can keep playing with that. But here we've got half of it gets. Right? So maybe, what can we do now? Yeah? There's the CK in the uh, third bit. You can guess there's a vowel before it. CK here? Yeah, so we can maybe think that there's a vowel here. Because, so we can use basically clues based on what we know, right? And what we see here that we've guessed. We can say, hey, maybe there's a vowel which could help us with shifting. Um, we could see, let's see, there's a uh, Yeah, so there's a lot of different things we could do. Um, so obviously there's clearly a track that uh, this is taking here. We could take all that, and I'm sure we could solve this as a group. These are all uh, very, very smart. So we can look for clues. We can maybe, you know, this would be one thing, of trying the last line, maybe A-J-E. We could try, hey, that looks like the English word R, which would be something that we would actually expect it's a frequent word, too. So we can maybe try mapping A to S in the second, um, in the second alphabet. And we can look at back here at our frequency analysis, say, does this make sense? Uh, mapping, shifting the whole alphabet this way. And now, So what things kind of pop out? But yeah, we have a word, right? But R, like those are both frequent three-letter words, right? So we're we're kind of making some kind of progress. So the word none, 
So the other thing that's tricky with these, right, is adding these artificial spacings every fifth letter kind of messes with you trying to uh, put these together. So you have to remember that when you're uh, looking at these things. None. Rick. You'd also look, I mean, you'd also look for other, like if there's a T, H, and then something, you'd probably think that's a the, so you'd try shifting that next one to an E, which I don't think we have here. There's an H, E, though. Which one? There's an H, E. Um, the fifth one down, first column, you have an H E in a row, so maybe try to shift the H to a T. This one. Oh, this one, yeah. So maybe you try to sh shift this P to a T. Or the, uh, it's H H E, H -E so the Oh, H -E sorry, this H. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, you can barely tell the difference between these on this slide. Uh, okay. Yeah, we could try that. Um, another thing, and this is kind of enough, I'm not sure how you would know this, you would try all these things. Uh, that you could maybe say that the um, last line suggests an ending for an adjective, so I C A L. Uh, so you could try shifting the fourth alphabet O to A, and you could get something that looks uh, getting more and more close. You're saying words, good, so that also shifted the good, but we got that there. Um, and uh, what are some other things that we try to guess that? So now I have a nice letter here. Why do I have a nice letter here? Because we know that's the U. U. Yeah, so U, Q, U almost always follows Q, so we can try shifting that. We can also brute force the last alphabet. You're basically already there. Uh, so it's just a silly limerick thing. I don't know. Uh, I don't really want to read it. It's kind of dumb, but you can read it. <laughs> Questions on this? We just broke this cipher without any knowledge of the keys of this cipher text. Yeah. So when you shift the third and the sixth alphabets in the beginning. Why did we stop there and not try to shift the direction of the first instead of trying to like Just to show different ways of like after you've shifted, after you've guessed a few of the alphabets, then starting to put them together rather than just relying on the frequencies. Like those are, that's a nice way to help guide you at the start. Uh, and then I, I would actually probably do both, right? And I would say, okay, well, what's the, um, what's the right shift? Uh, what do the frequencies say I should try for shifts? And then what does that actually do if I think that the first two, or I have the first three alphabets? And then I would do it with this. Once you start breaking, that becomes easier and easier. Yeah. Is there a way to, like, how would you automate this? Because it seems like a lot of it is, like, human involved. Like, you have to tell us if it makes sense or not. Good question. So how would you automate this? Space. You people tell me, yeah. You know, have a dictionary set up, basically. Um, doing like guess and check type work. Okay, so you can do guess and check in some sense, right? So you could um, try, so yeah, one way to do it, you'd have some way to verify are you correct, right? And that could be dictionary, but I guess it's kind of tricky. Are you gonna look for all the dictionary words in your text, right? So you have to deal with that, yeah. Yeah, you can actually parse the dictionary for different types of, so that would be like a weird uh, three or four gram, I think. You could look for very common three, two, three, and four letter um, words in English. Like those could help guide you to tell you when you're correct. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is, a lot of this is based on the idea that you know the probability of the words in, or the letters in an alphabet. Couldn't you just like really destroy their method, this method of picking it apart by doing something like, okay, we're just not going to put vowels in places where it's obvious what vowel goes there, and then we're just going to add to the end of every word alternating Q and Z. Okay. So, or Q, X, and Z, or something like that at the end of every word. And then to a human eye, you might be able to look at it and distinguish it. If you, if you do the key, shift everything, then the human eye, you go, okay, this isn't exactly equal, but I get the idea. See what they were writing in this message, but it would completely destroy your probability tables. Yes, in some sense.
sense. Although the interesting thing to think about is, is that, you know, is this now part of your algorithms, or are you assuming that somebody knows, because it's part of the process of transforming plain text, which doesn't have those characters, to <coughs> cipher text, which now it does. So you're inserting characters. So one thing you think about is, uh, is this just part of that, that thing? The other thing to worry about is, uh, are you adding additional signals that maybe somebody could use, right? Because they can see, hmm, there's the similar or the same characters repeating every two to five. So you look at the distribution between those characters because they don't frequently appear in English. So you look at a frequency of all these characters and you'd say, hey, that's like word sizes in English. But how would they, but how would they even realize that it was those letters to begin with that you're shifting over those letters? Well, actually, in that case, you maybe not don't care. Maybe you just drop those letters and start focusing just word by word. And you use those to maybe break up the, yeah, there's, there's interesting things you can think about doing to hide the statistical analysis here. But fundamentally, somebody can still, you can still use these principles to try to, and you know, computers are very fast, so you can try brute forcing a lot of things, and you can have tricks to say when it starts making sense, give it to a human so they can look at it, and maybe go from there and figure out what's wrong. Yeah, right, say with a sufficient, sufficiently smart computer and person, you would, you would be, that would not be a great defense. Yeah. Um, also, to like confirm that you have like a word, you can also like check if like there is a sequence of things that are just impossible. Right. So yeah, you could check. That would be a good one. Yeah, check if sequences of things. So you could, because okay, basically, I mean, you've done uh, what the dynamic programming, right? In some sense, or just backtracking, right? I mean, the idea is you're making a bunch of decisions. So for each, so you try. You know, you'd sort all possible key lengths and you'd try them in order. Your algorithm would just try them what's most likely to least likely of the periods based on the repetitions, right? You can write a program that finds repetitions. You can write a program that breaks them down into factors. You can write a program that figures out what are the most common factors and then orders the list of periods to try from most likely to least likely. Then you can have another program that takes that in, does exactly what we did and then evaluates and returns what's the most likely um, key for that guess based on these measures. So you could define these different things that define when you're correct. So you could say, you could create a measure of how close is this to English, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, you can definitely do it, but I wouldn't do it in the sense of, uh, I wouldn't say that it works all the time 100%, but you could say it pops out five answers and then you select which one you think it is. So there is some human intelligence here, but. Cool, anything else? All right, so other types of ciphers, right? So we've been looking at ciphers that do what fundamentally? Are there any rotation here? Yeah, so shift in terms of plain text to cipher text, right? So cipher text comes in, and we're mapping one character to another. Other ways to think about it is what if we just rearrange letters in the plain text? So what's some of the nice things here? So if we just rearrange the letters in the plain text. Yeah. Right, so we don't have to worry about, so now the, the frequency of letters are the same, right? But they're just not in the correct order. Right, so this is actually good. So we get this, but what? So the one gram frequencies, right? So the one letter frequencies are the same. But what's not the same from plain text? Yeah. So the frequency of one character following another character, right? So this is, we can say two gram, three gram, all the way up to n gram. We can, we can actually calculate this for English. And we used that even when we were breaking the uh, Visionaire cipher, right? We said, okay, hey, there's a Q. 
that means it's very likely that a U follows it, right? So that's a two gram frequency that we're looking at here. So here, we've kept the one gram frequency, the single, single letter occurrence, but since we've swapped letters and moved letters around, it's gonna have different n gram frequencies. And thinking what we've been talking about, right, the index of coincidence is gonna be exactly the same as it was in a Caesar cipher and in plain English, because we haven't transformed any of the letters or changed any of the letters to something else. So we'll look at this. You can actually take this very complicated, and of course the question is what letters do you swap, right? In which positions, right? Because you need some algorithm to do this on any arbitrary size text, so your crypto system has to do this. Um, there are many different ways to do this. Uh, we're just gonna look at just one because I think it's, it gets kind of redundant to look at all these different types of uh, uh, transposition ciphers. So, we're first going to break the message into blocks of some type of key length to do this transposition cipher. And we're not going to worry. We're going to assume right now that all of our uh, messages are the same, are in chunks of the size of the key length. And the key is the transposition of the block. So for instance, so basically, we have a key 3, 0, 2, 1. We're always thinking zero index based. So this means, so the key is size four, so we split our plain text up into characters of groups of four, and then we're gonna shift each group such that um, the zero in the plain text maps to the third character of the output, the first character maps to the zero character, the third, mm -hmm. the second maps to the second, and the third maps to the first. So this key is giving us the order of swapping that. Does that make sense? So if we have a message, ASC was awesome, we split this up into blocks of four, and so what's the output here gonna be? So this goes where? The A goes where? The last block. So the zero character maps to the last. And this one maps here to the first one. Second one stays where? <coughs> the same. And the first one maps to the first. And we can do that for each of them. Just swapping. Yeah. Um, can you repeat that process? Sure. So the key here says, so the key, so the key right has uh, position zero, position one, position two, position three. So basically take a, a block that's the size of the key length in, map the zero character of the input plain text to the third character of the ciphertext. And then map the first character of the plain text to the zero character of the ciphertext. Map the second character of the plain text to the second character of the ciphertext. Map the third character of the ciphertext to the first character of the, sorry, the third character of the plain text to the first character of the ciphertext. So basically, you can drop arrows, right? Zero goes to three, uh, one goes to zero, two goes to two, and three goes to one. And this zero, one, two, three is implicit based on the number in the key. This would be a little bit easier to brute force, wouldn't it, so long as the key wasn't too long? Why? So what are the possibilities? Um, so say I'm checking, so I need to figure out two things. One, what's the key length, mm -hmm. and two, what's the ordering? Yep. Uh, so if I'm making a guess that the key length is four, um, here's how many guesses I need to make. I need, there's four possible for the first one, three for the second, two for the third, one for the last. Uh, so I think it's like you have 24 attempts for a length of four. Yes, definitely. Right, and right. Okay, so we can see this the case here. So yeah, there's that interesting factor. So it's not just that the way that the key size impacts the security of the root force is very different, right? Because in the previous example, we add a new key length. That choice is independent from all the other choices. So it was 26 times whatever we were, or 26 to the power of whatever we were doing. 
here to get the equivalent uh, input space, we need a much larger key that swaps things uh, much larger. How, uh, so A, we could try to brute force it. What are some other ways we could try attacking this? Yeah. I mean, you could also find the key length pretty easily, because given it's especially long enough, you need to have the same distribution, like a body distribution as a English. Ah, OK, interesting. Uh, which letter distribution, I guess? Because the, so the whole thing, right, because we haven't changed any characters. So all of the frequencies in the original plain text is exactly the same in the ciphertext. But as you can, like, if you have a sufficient long enough key, and like, you notice like several vowels and like an area and stuff like that, uh, you kind of know like, depending on how long you think words are, how many vowels should be in a word, things like that. I see, yeah, so we can use the, again, it goes back to the, the end grant, right? We can use um, distributions of letters so we can see what are likely correct uh, transpositions, and we can try brute forcing those. So we can see letters that are likely to be followed by each other, and if they're not followed by each other, then we can say maybe something's wrong. Like they should be swapped so that could give us a bounded key length, I think is what you're going for there. Um, yeah, we can try that. What are some other things we can try?
this L came from all the way at the end of the ciphertext, right? The hello world. Uh, we could do this of size, you know, depending on how long our plain text is, we could go uh, three columns, four columns, five columns, right? That could be that would be our key size that would rearrange these in different letters in different ways. Uh, again, how to attack this? I actually I'll go over it briefly, right? We can look at anagrams, which is essentially the Scrabble idea that we talked about. Um, we can rearrange the letters, exploit some pattern, and if it's a Rails friend cipher, we can actually kind of easily check this. But um, there's all different types of ways you can do this, but again, swapping the order of letters kind of uh, doesn't get you too much. So if we're given just some ciphertext, we don't necessarily know exactly what algorithm is used. How do we go about that? Like, what are our steps? So we look at the frequency of letters, we can use some statistical tests that we've looked at to try to say, does this look like a normal distribution of English test? Um, we can say a Caesar cipher is actually pretty easy to test for, right? We can brute force that. Um, we can look at the index of coincidence. Uh, we can look at correlation. We can look at different frequency distributions. Uh, single letters, two letters, as many letters as we want. Exploiting common English patterns, we could say Q is always called by U, P is the most common letter, right? These are actually all things we did by using statistical measures to actually uh, do these types of things. Okay, real world examples. Real world doesn't use shifts. Why not? I mean, it's easy to break, but, well, okay, I'll say this instead rather than this. Uh, real world crypto usually uses XOR rather than shifts. Why? Yeah, so XOR is reversible, right? So you can have your, if rather than shifting the Caesar cipher alphabet, you XOR the letter with a number and then got a new letter, right? That would still work. Uh, you could do it in the reverse. You can go backwards, right? Your encryption and decryption are actually exactly the same algorithm. Uh, also, XOR is very fast on CPUs. Addition is, I mean, not only addition, right? But when you're shifting, you need to worry about modulo and making sure you're staying in the same range, right? So that can actually be slower than usually an XOR. So basically, all modern crypto uses XOR under the hoods to do this. And the super interesting thing is that, um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, all the complex will look, yeah, we'll look at, a, um, at like real world crypto systems and we'll see they're actually just built up of substitutions and transpositions. And that's basically all they are at the root. Uh, okay, I may send this again. Everybody tries to implement their own crypto. Everybody thinks they're smart and brilliant and they should be writing crypto. Uh, don't do that. Side channel attacks. So this is crazy things where people have shown, they first showed that, uh, so CPUs, everyone knows CPU processor, right? Uses various amounts of power depending on what it's doing. So they found that you could actually, if you put like a sensor to determine how much a computer, how much power a computer is using, when it's computing crypto operations, you can actually infer the private key from those operations because different operations use different amounts of power. So you could actually break the key just by observing the power. And then they went even further. So is anyone's laptop fan currently on? Does anybody's laptop fan ever go on? When and why does it do that? Yeah, when it's over, when it's heating up, when you're computing something, when you're compiling something, running something. So they've actually found that by just observing the fan noise, that's enough of a side channel that leaks the power usage of the CPU that they can recover crypto keys from. Um, in addition to that, timing attacks. So this is a big thing that people often mess up. Uh, CPUs are very complicated and will often try to optimize different paths. And if it's optimizing based on your 
based on the private key, you can actually leak the private key based on just timing different operations. So if you have a crypto operation that fails early when something doesn't match, you can actually use that to break and brute force the key oftentimes. And the timing difference can be very, very small because you can use multiple samples and draw different distributions to determine things. It's actually crazy insane. Um, I will say uh, one of the cool things when I played DEF CON 12 2011, there was a 300 point challenge called binary weakness. Uh, we were given a tar archive, so just like a tar archive that uh, we've seen with dex, a dex file and JPEG, a JPGS. Uh, what's a dex file? Dexterity file. No, not dexterity file. Anybody doing any Android development? Never built an app, and nobody. Some people. Yeah, so this is a compiled Java, like the equivalent of a class, but for Android, and I think it's maybe for old versions of Android. So it's a compiled version of a Java application, and the JPEG-S was like this encrypted file, so you looked at it, and it was all um, basically random-ish. We looked, and we found that it was actually a real app that still exists. So this is an app that exists on the App Store, and we looked at it, this is an app that allows you to encrypt your pictures, and has a public, a free version and a paid version, and this was the free version, so what we found out, what they did is they took a picture of a whiteboard that had the flag written on it, and then encrypted it using this app, and as we investigated it, the encryption was an XOR 8-byte key. So it was a visionary cipher with eight bytes, eight, like the period of eight, and so then we had to use this to break it into those JPEG files. So how do we do it? Yeah, so any, we know that it's an XOR, right? And we know that the length is eight. We can look for repetition, which is kind of difficult in a JPEG file, because you have pixels that are weird values. How do we know it's a JPEG file? How does anybody know what any file is? No, not the extension. Extensions are lies. <laughs> yeah, Windows land. Yeah. What's it? File header. The file header, yes. Almost every single file, file format has a, a series of magic bytes in the header that tell you exactly what the file is. I don't remember what they are for JPEG, but almost every file has this. So what we're able to do, that gave us two bytes, so it gave us two of the keys. So we were able to reduce this from an eight byte key to a six byte key because we knew exactly what those two bytes were because it had to be the exact JPEG headers. Then we used various other aspects of the JPEG header and we said, okay, uh, this byte also has to be the same in a normal JPEG file. So you use basically like a known plain text attack because we knew what the plain text should look like I think we got, we broke three or four of the eight bytes, and then at that point we just brute forced it until um, a JPEG reader could read it, and then at that point we had the thing, popped up the image, and got the flag. Uh, so people really do mess this up. When I keep saying people roll it on crypto, this is real stuff. This is real applications that is not good. So don't be one of these people. Use modern symmetric encryption, which we'll talk about on 